again, I'm going to thank Steve and the Albuquerque Historical Society for inviting me to do this presentation today, the Albuquerque Museum for allowing us to use this facility, and welcome all of you and everybody that's uh, watching on Facebook today. For the last five years, my documentary partner, Charles McLean, and I have been privileged to produce a series called Neighborhoods at a Crossroads for the City of Albuquerque's uh, GOV TV cable channel. The series began with a request by the Public Art Program to produce a video on Martinez Town, which is home to two large public art pieces and at the time had just been designated part of the National Historic Trail. In the course of our research for that piece, we learned the history of the neighborhood and incorporated it in the video. Our bosses at GovTV liked it so much, they said, why don't you do some more of these? Uh, that looked pretty good. So, We've since produced pieces on Alamosa, Borellas, uh, Thomas Village Wells Park, and of course, Hoffman Town, which we're going to watch today. The Crossroads theme initially reflected the fact that Martinez was the original big eye back in the day where the, uh, east, the main east-west route from the mountains to Old Town intersected with the Camino Real. Um, but we learned as we did more of these pieces that all the neighborhoods were figuratively at a crossroads in the ever-changing town road that is Albuquerque. So we adopted that as our theme. Um, and while each neighborhood has a unique uh, history, of course, some common themes emerged. Almost all the neighborhoods um, have, have struggled with one or more of the usual urban challenges, crime, drugs, poverty, homelessness, pollution, pollution and um, redlining. But as we learned in several cases, they were also victimized by well-intentioned government programs under the umbrella of urban renewal. Sweeping programs, kind of like great ideas in the 60s and 70s, but result, but. Uh, the results in Albuquerque were kind of mixed, especially in Borellas, Wells Park, and Martinez Town, where many long-term residents believe they contributed to the deterioration of the communities. But, but one of the positive things that we hope viewers will take away from these pieces is the sense of resilience in these neighborhoods and the power of community organizing. Activists have indeed revived these neighborhoods and have proven in numerous instances that you can work with City Hall to get what you want, but more importantly, when necessary, you can fight City Hall or the state or even the feds to win. The pride that residents took in their neighborhoods outweighed the obstacles they faced and motivated them to make these changes. Each, uh, each of the, the neighborhood profiles features interviews with people who live and work in these communities. And it's become apparent with each new piece how important it is to hear their voices. Uh, the pictures they paint are often, often markedly different from the common perception of these neighborhoods. For me personally, one of the most satisfying parts of doing these profiles has been meeting uh, what I call local heroes from these neighborhoods, folks like Chris and Jeanette Baca, Jesse and Fred Seiss, Frank Martinez, Michael Gonzalez, Eric Riego, Diana Dorn Jones, and a host of others. They're truly inspiring and, for the most part, unknown to the rest of the city. We hope our series uh, changes that. Today's presentation, uh, as Steve mentioned, focuses on Hoffman Town, a neighborhood that is notable for pioneering the rapid expansion into the Northeast Heights of Albuquerque during the post World War II population. While Hoffman Town didn't face all the challenges that some of these older neighborhoods did, building on the edge of town at that time was a leap of faith for Sam Hoffman and other developers like Dale Bellema and Ed Snow. But obviously, uh, all we have to do is look to the Northeast and we can see that it paid off. As <laughs> we have uh, building all the way up to the mountains. Um, Case of Hoffman Town, it was a planned community, one of the first what we would really consider planned communities in the city, and would serve as a model for future growth in the city and attract and support the, the city's growing middle class. To wrap it up here real quickly, I just want to say I, I think these profiles have become an important way to uh, preserve our local history, um, expose viewers to the diversity.
diversity within our community and build pride in those featured neighborhoods. We hope they also serve as an inspiration for citizens in all parts of Albuquerque to keep working to improve their neighborhoods. And um, since I have a captive audience, I, uh, I, I hope you enjoy today's piece and I encourage you to delve into all six pieces and, uh, and the two that are on the way eventually, South Broadway and Taylor Ranch. So uh, without any further ado, let's uh, we'll watch the film and I will be around afterwards to uh, take questions. Thank you. Drive through the Hoffman Town neighborhood in Northeast Albuquerque and you'll find all the signs of a settled middle-class enclave tucked into one of the busiest areas of the city. But decades ago, after World War II, it represented a pioneering expansion to the edge of the city and a harbinger for the explosive growth of Albuquerque. Leading the way were three major developers, Dale Bellama, Ed Snow, and a Russian emigre named Sam Hoffman, a former plasterer and truck driver from Chicago who became one of the largest home builders in the country after moving to the Southwest. The subdivision would soon become home to the influx of engineers and employees from the fledgling Sandia Laboratory and the rapidly growing Kirtland Air Force Base. In addition to the Hoffman Town subdivision, Hoffman built an iconic shopping center, the forerunner of shopping malls to come, that still thrives today. While Hoffman's life would end in tragedy, the subdivision, with its large park and convenient shopping, served as a model for future growth in Albuquerque's Northeast Heights. At the end of World War II, Albuquerque was a, a town of approximately 50,000 people. Showed that the, the uh, what seemed to be a whole lot of pent-up energy, which the, the city had, uh, there was a big celebration of the war's end, a parade, and it seemed as if everything was just almost ready to bust open. The population of Albuquerque approximately doubled its size between 1945 and 1950, and again between 1950 and 1960, it just about doubled again. Went from about 50,000 in 1945 to around 100,000 in 1950 to almost 200,000 in 1960. It slowed down after that but it was, it was in the high 200,000s by 1972. There was a period in the 1950s, and I couldn't, can't tell you the exact date, when it was uh, considered the fastest growing city in the country. While some city boosters feared a recession following the war, the presence of Sandia Corporation and the large number of military personnel who had served at Kirtland Army Airfield during and after the war and chose to stay here allayed those fears. There was a big need for housing, um, and um, there were large fortunes to be made by, uh, by the big builders, um, the, particularly since many of the, the newcomers were educated, well-employed, and could afford housing. The biggest builders after the war were Sam Hoffman, Ed Snow, and Dale Bellamy. They all had a lot in common. They, they, they were all very hardworking. In many cases, they have been uh, put on their own at an early age. They were big dreamers. They, they had ideas about how, how the Albuquerque could develop. They all knew each other and they were all kind of competing with each other. The oldest one, Sam Hoffman was born in 1900 in Polish Russia and he emigrated as a result of the Russian Revolution to Chicago where he became a plasterer and then he ran a trucking company. Then because of the cold weather he moved to Phoenix. Apparently Sam Hoffman was a Russian uh, immigrant and he spent uh, uh, he spent time learning about the plaster trade I was reading about him a little bit, and so that's how he got his introduction to 
the building, and then he bought a house, and before he even, as, it, as, it, as they said, apparently before he even moved into this house that he built for himself, he sold it and then started, he saw there was money to be made and then just went wild, I guess. Together with his son, developed a, a, a housing uh, company, and he, uh, he kept his central office in Phoenix. However, he, did, he came to Albuquerque, um, began Hoffman Town in, around the corner of Wyoming and Manal, began that in 1950. By 1952, there were about 800 homes that, that he had built and sold, and it was the, the largest subdivision in the state. I know that Sam Hoffman uh, built houses in Las Vegas, Phoenix, Chicago, and Denver, even, uh, maybe, maybe other places. At one point in the, in the early 50s, he was the third largest builder in the, in the country. Hoffman aimed his subdivision at Albuquerque's growing middle class, and the sturdy modern homes in the expertly planned community would lure buyers from everywhere. Bernard and I, my husband and I, were living, he was in construction, and we were living in a 10 by 47 trailer uh, on the south side of town over on Utah. And for some reason, we started going to Annunciation Church, which is right down the street here. And uh, I don't know why, but we were drawn to this neighborhood. And after we had the third child, we said, we need to get out of this 10 by seven trailer. So I started looking at homes in, um, in, in this neighborhood. He showed me this one on the corner. I said, oh, it's a mansion. After living in a 10 by 47 trailer, it was a mansion, 1599 square feet, 1,599 square feet. It had uh, one and three quarter baths, attached brick garage, and it was uh, $9,775. It had everything we wanted. So I told Bernard, if you get me this house, I'll never ask for another house. I'll never ask for another one. And I'm still here. I was 24 years old and I'm 80 now and I'm still here and I don't want to be anywhere else. It was a beautiful neighborhood when I was growing up. I mean, it was all these homes and all these people and it was a lot of families and everybody was very prideful of their homes. And Hoffman, the person who built these neighborhoods right here, his big thing was to have a church, a shopping center, a park, all within walking distance. So we had all of that. And Hoffman Town Baptist Church used to be. Now they're out there at Haynes and, um, and Wyoming Academy in that area. Um, and there's somebody else in there now, but Hoffman Town Baptist Church used to be right there at Manal in Wyoming. I moved in here in, uh, in October, and I've owned it ever since. I bought it because of the trees, the brick construction, and its proximity to the park. And it, all those things turned out to be okay. While adults appreciated the comforts of the homes and the many amenities, the proximity to wide open spaces delighted the many children from the neighborhood. This, this was at the outer limits of Albuquerque. And so when people bought a house up there, they were kind of taking a chance. They sort of like on the frontier. As kids, we would take either hiking trips or biking trips going usually either north or east. And if we went east, we'd end up going uh, up Manal and we'd end up uh, at the Whitewash, which is uh, a rock formation in the foothills of the Sandia. We'd be playing there all day, maybe uh, 10 years old. We'd have our sack lunch and our canteen and we'd hang out there all day, climbing around rocks, and, and we would use traveling groups. And so we felt very safe going out there by ourselves, again, without any adult supervision. And we really enjoyed that, to be out there all by ourselves. Then when we headed uh, north 
for uh, our day trips, we would go out um, along Wyoming towards what's now the Academy property. At that point, it was just stables, so school had not been built. But we would uh, occasionally go out and, and uh, capture snakes and lizards and either bring them home and, and have them as pets or sell them to, to pet stores. There was nothing like Eubank, Quantabo, that was a dream. I mean, that was, that's where you would go to drive or learn to drive and stuff like that. That was really one of the nicest things about growing up there and the fact that we, we, could, uh, we could cover acres upon acres of, of land uh, and it was not developed and we could just, uh, we could run through the arroyos, we could, uh, you know, probably not very safe, but we did that anyway. The area was so remote that an airport bordered Hoffman Town to the west, although it probably ceased operations by the time residents had moved in. Where I'm sitting right now was at the approach end of one of the runways out here. It was uh, Snell, Harold Snell, uh, built that during the war. Uh, and it had, uh, there were all dirt runways. And there was a little hangar out there and a, a, he lived out there in one of the, the buildings. And I got my first airplane ride when I was uh, probably four years old, three years old. The Army Air Corps used Snells for touch and goes with the light observation, L-4s and that type of aircraft. So they also trained some uh, military glider pilots. They would use that because it was out in the middle of nowhere. Despite its remoteness, the neighborhood proved convenient for the influx of scientists and engineers now populating Sandia National Laboratories and Kirtland Air Force Base. It was a interesting neighborhood because we had all kinds of uh, interesting people here working at the base, working at Kirtland. When we did move in this house, all, most of the people around us were engineers at Sandia, or employees at Sandia. My husband was a construction worker. Well, we had three kids, a collie dog, a welding truck, a doom buggy, uh, and I'm sure they all thought, uh-oh, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> When not exploring the surrounding desert, there was plenty to occupy neighborhood children. Well, Hoffman Town was an ideal place for kids to grow up in. It had to do with the, the uh, generosity of the space provided by the builder, as well as the time, where, where there weren't such concerns about safety and where kids could go and do their own thing and just have fun. And we, and we had a lot of fun, I'll tell you. There were neighbors living next to us, middle of the block, and we'd been here for a few months, and we got to know them pretty good, but, you know, my brother and I wanted new friends, and we saw these guys move in, and figured we'd better come down and see if they had any boys that we could play with, or any kids we could play with, and it's all been downhill ever since. That was 64, uh, the year was 64, so I was just getting ready to go into first grade. Well, the first thing is my mom would say, get out of here and blow the stink off. <laughs> so, <laughs> we could do anything we want as long as it wasn't in the house. Just get out of here and go to the park or just get the heck out of the house. That was the main thing. There's a, there was a place called the A pool. And it's a swimming pool that was in the shape of an A. And it had an island in the middle, and the deep end would be, I guess, the two legs of the A, I don't remember, but it was the A pool. And everybody would go there. In fact, Sandia High School, before they got their pool, that's where they used to take their kids, their swim team, to practice. And the A pool is now the Southwest Daycare Center. But the A pool is the one iconic, because everybody went there. That's where you would go swimming, it was at the A pool. As the neighborhood grew, the massive Hoffman Town Park became the center of various activities. Well, the, the biggest thing I remember about Hoffman Town area when I was growing up was the park. The park was uh, very distinctive in, in, in terms of its size in relation to other parks in, in town. Hoffman Town Park used to just be a, a dirt lot. 
before they made it into uh, grass and, and planted all the trees and everything. And it was uh, it was a little different, you know. And then they put in the swing set. We had the baseball backstops came in later, and the tennis courts, and then the basketball courts. And we played a lot of basketball, a lot of tennis, and uh, a lot of bicycle. And a lot of football. A lot of football with his brother. <laughs> the best thing about living here is the park. I, I, to me, it's like an extension of our front yard. Way back in the 1970s, um, the hot air balloons used to land in the park. There'd be hundreds of people gathered in the park watching the balloons come down. So my kids, oh my gosh, that was just the most awesome thing because they're right there. And we'd all run out the door, run over and see, see the balloons land and check them out. And it was pretty exciting, yeah. When we got into high school, we would sneak out at night out of our bedrooms and we would go hang out at the park during the night. This was the early 70s, and then sneak back in before morning, but we never got caught, so uh, those were fun times. Well, it wasn't always <laughs> fun and tough fun and games, but... Yeah, um, there, during those times there was rumbles, where high schools rumbled against each other, and Manzano rumbled Sandia in the park when I was a kid, and. And there was some pretty rough stuff going on back in those days. And I don't know why they were rumbling, but that was one of the big deals was these big rumbles that happened. Okay, then by the time we got that age, um, we were very peaceful. There was no rumbling going on. In yeah. fact, yeah. They, were, they were more into streaking. <laughs> yeah, back when yeah, we were in so high we, had, school, yeah. we had streaking <laughs> going on. In the 70s um, and early si or late 60s, early 70s, um, the hippies came to the park. My parents were very conservative people. And um, they they park right in front of the house here. And they'd play their music real loud and long-haired guys. And, and that kind of worried my parents, you know. And they would see them drinking over there, alcohol. And they knew that there was drug dealing going on. And my dad had binoculars. <laughs> and he would spy on them out the window. It just got pretty rambunctious. So my dad and mom, they were one of the first people to f help form the Hoffman Town Neighborhood Association. You know, Linda has mentioned some of the problems with the park. Back then, I was part of that problem, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, I was one of the freaks that used to hang out in that park a lot, and, and uh, it was a great park. At that time, you could cruise around the park endlessly until they blocked off the one corner over there. Oh, my husband and I, we sometimes, um, we catch ourselves looking over there, and um, I might even pull out the binoculars and just get a closer look at <laughs> what's going on in our neighborhood. Just southwest of the subdivision loomed another landmark, the Hoffman Town Center, which became the model for one-stop shopping. Hoffman Town Center wasn't the very first uh, shopping center in, in the, the city. The Knob Hill Center, which started in 1947 by uh, Wagaman, uh, was considered the very first shopping center. The Hoffman Town Center was larger than that. It started about um, 1951, I believe. And um, it was the largest one in town at that time. The Hoffman Town Shopping Center had everything you needed. There was uh, stores from one end to the other. And we had Ben Franklin and another supermarket, uh, Barber's Grocery Store. Campbell's Drug, which was quite exclusive at the time. It had a fragrance and makeup counter. Uh, we had a hardware store, 
shoe and boot repair, which is still there to this day, and um, pen and pad, everything. It was before Winrock and Coronado, so, you know, we, we had everything within walking distance. But Hoffman Town was always there. There was a Barber's Supermarket. I remember we used to go to Barber's Supermarket, and then we used to go buy the penny candy and then go to the library. It was just a neighborhood, and you didn't worry. I mean, my parents, we used to go all around, and nobody would ever worry that we, we would just be home. I do remember Charlie's. I, I miss that place. It was uh, Charlie's back door and Charlie's front door. And it was the same restaurant, but they had a back entrance and the front entrance at the front of the uh, shopping center. That was the hangout for the whole neighborhood. A lot, I mean, not for the whole neighborhood, but a lot of us hung out in that Charlie's back door. It was quaint, dark, and interestingly enough, you could smoke in the bar, but not in the restaurant at the time, which, so people would go in the bar to eat so they could smoke while they were eating. <laughs> but they had really good food there, and I miss that place. But with the, the building of Hoffman Town, it, it was natural to build a, a shopping center right uh, on the edge of that because uh, of the obvious advantages of, of to the people living there. They wouldn't have to travel so far. Um, and at, as a result, um, whenever a, a new big subdivision was built, a shopping center would be built along with it uh, from that point on. After Hoffman spent almost a decade leaving his mark on the Northeast Heights, he launched his most ambitious project, Hoffman City, on Albuquerque's west side. But issues with titles and mineral rights bogged the project down. And there were other problems, just uh, the fact that the, uh, the population uh, boom had, been, had slowed down. This was in 1959, and so he wasn't able to sell, to pre-sell as many homes as he had imagined, as he planned on. And uh, problems just kept building up and building up and there were more and more delays and he was calling in a bind for financing. He complained about the pressure he was under. And eventually, in late 1959, probably because of the, of the pressures of developing the area, he and his wife got in an argument. He shot his wife and then he shot himself. And so the whole scheme started to go kaput. But it was a, a huge shock in the, in, the, in the real estate field in Albuquerque. In many ways, it was a, um, a wonderful story about how about somebody through the force of his own will and hard work was able to make something of, him, of himself. Um, very inspiring story on the one hand. On the other hand, the fact that it, that it apparently led to his committing an awful crime and, and, and killing his wife and, and himself seems like the stuff of melodrama. It's um, too good a story to, to leave alone. Um, there must be more to it than, than made the newspapers, but um, in, in many ways, it seems like the sort of thing that Anne Rand would write about, or um, novelists of, of, of dealing with American commercial empires. Uh, the mighty people rose from nothing, and then they fell like a Shakespearean drama. Competitor Ed Snow would take over the troubled project, which eventually turned into Westgate Heights. As the Hoffman Town neighborhood matured over the decades, it faced issues of drug dealing, property crimes, and homelessness that afflict the rest of the city. Whether through neighborhood watch programs, Facebook, or even picnics, the Neighborhood Association has brought residents together to face those challenges. I have been on the Neighborhood Association on and off for 20 years. I just thought it was really important to keep our neighborhood together, keep it nice. Basically, it's just the neighbors getting together and making sure things stay nice, communicate with each other. 
And I think, you know, the, as a neighborhood, we are a community and we really need to build that community together. But the solution has to come from the people that they live here. Uh, the police, no matter how effective they are, they cannot do that for us. You have to take matters into your own hands uh, to a point. You know, you have to be diligent. You have to watch out for your neighbors or suspicious activity. Um, people need to be involved for that reason. I, I know, um, uh, you know, the police can't do it all. We don't expect them to do it all. Um, their hands are tied in many ways and and so I think it's just getting to be more where, where people in the neighborhoods just need to be more involved for their own sake and the sake of their neighbors. With its convenient location, top-notch schools, and affordable homes, the neighborhood remains a draw for people of all ages and backgrounds. And even as the neighborhood evolves, say residents, it retains its best qualities. You just see changes all the time. It's constant change. Now, now it's turned over again, and little kids are out. Yesterday, they, when all the rain was coming in and the streets were flooded, there are kids out in the street wading in the water like my kids used to do. And I didn't see that for a long time. It was, so you can see the, the turnover again. And I, I like it, I like it to see those little kids out there playing, because it's been a long time. It's become, in a way, a lot nicer because it is more diverse now than it was before. And that is kind of, you know, like bringing a new flavor to the community. Um, I like that. And it has changed in that respect. People's attitude, um, it's different a little bit, you know, they are more aware of the, that diversity. When people buy houses in Hoffman Town, they don't leave. For some reason. Um, there are still people who live here who are original owners. Um, and not only do they not leave, but then their children end up living in the same neighborhood. Like, my daughter lives down the street. She bought a house here in Hoffman Town. So, yeah, it's for some reason we all stick around. It's great here. I couldn't ask for better neighbors. And I know them all, and they all know me, of course. <laughs> I, I can't even have a, a stranger come to the house, and my neighbors are calling and saying, there's a car in your driveway and I've got the license number. Oh no, it's okay. Don't haul it off, it's my friend. <laughs> when I look back, uh, things were new. We were out in the open. We could walk and take a little hike out in the Mesa. Uh, the people were very friendly. Uh, crime was, I would say, non-existent. I guess the most important thing that comes to mind for me is that Hoffman Town is, is in some ways a throwback to the 50s and 60s. It's still a neighborhood, and I think that's important. Pretty much Beaver Cleaver neighborhood back then. I can't really remember anything really dramatic happening in our neighborhood. I mean, so I think when I have my tombstone, I don't really want my name or anything. I just want 87110 put on my tombstone because this neighborhood is just, for me, it's just been a wonderful neighborhood to grow up in. The, the best thing about it is that just, I still like the house, still like the, the neighborhood, and I'm comfortable with it. You know, it, it's, it fits like an old glove. And I have no desire to go anywhere else. I'd say the best thing was um, that we had good neighbors. You know, we really had neighbors that watched out for each other and, and kind of tough on being a kid because you couldn't get away with a whole lot, you know, but, but really um, it's what I learned from my mom and dad was that good neighbors make a big difference.
in the Heights? For that particular neighborhood or just? The whole Heights itself is in, is oh, in Ridley. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I can speak too much to that. I know Hoffman County actually isn't all a, completely a grid. Okay. Right within it, it's different. They vary the street pattern, but it's not a master grid scale of a half mile. Oh, yeah. Um, is, is there's a half by a half mile? Exactly. Is there a mile square? What's the size of that? That's uh, I'll I'll like a half goes from Wyoming on the neighborhood from Wyoming on the west side, the point east of Moon, so it's more than a, it's more of a rectangle. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know I can speak too much, but I know how much west side. What was that her Facebook? <laughs> is there a question or an answer? <laughs> There's an operator error. Um, I, yeah, I imagine that um, uh, what I understand about development of Northeast Heights, you know, the, the street grids were laid out first before anything. And so even if they were all dirt, the city knew where they was going, they were going and um, obviously did that in pretty much of a grid pattern in general for the major streets. And um, developers, of course, would be, uh, you know, waiting to hear where the streets were going and then they would start buying up property based on that. So they'd be right in the thoroughfares. So, uh, that's a, uh, yeah. It was pretty uh, obviously the Northeast Heights is laid out a lot differently than if you've got the whole town or something. <laughs> so, it was most of the heights, I guess, uh, the Northeast Heights. Yeah. Was I was wondering why Hoffman didn't start another development just right next to it or right near it, but rather than have this jump over west of the river, you know, which was totally unbuilt up mm -hmm. at that time. Uh -huh. money or do you why did well, yeah, well first thing? again he did build the one he did build Inez neighborhood which okay. was the one caddy oh, okay. so, yeah. um the west side I think at that time um there was nothing over there right and I think people saw a big opportunity they didn't understand and if you come and see my presentation on the Trisco land grant you'll understand better uh but there were still a lot of problems with titles and deeds and things on the west side because um, issues with the Atrisco land grant, the original Spanish land grant, had not been resolved into the 20th century. And uh, Sam, being from Phoenix, probably didn't really grasp that when he went out and bought a, that big chunk of land. Um, in any other circumstance, it probably would have been a great idea. <laughs> you know, I think he would have probably been as successful there. I mean, it was, again, a little far out from the west mm -hmm. side of town, but um, he'd already proven that he could do it in Northeast Heights and probably would have uh, would have been successful, but that was the difference. He was dealing with a whole other set of issues. Does somebody have a question over there? Okay, well, thank you for coming out. I appreciate it. Were there any questions off of Facebook or anything? No. Nope? Okay. And let's give a call out.